Well, thanks so much and uh, and welcome everybody. Um, yeah, I'll just jump right into it. Uh, so where where are we now and, and where do we think we're going with it? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll start with the definition. I've heard a lot and uh, some of them are so confusing and some of them from reputable sources that are so confusing. I really just want to keep it simple. It's, it is nothing more than the use of telecommunication tools to facilitate the delivery of dental care. So communication being the, uh, the important word here. And, and obviously since it's teledentistry, it's telecommunications, but it really is simple as that. We've got uh, synchronous and that doesn't have to be limited to just video. And a lot of people think of video when they think of uh, teledentistry, but certainly when you pick up a phone, if a patient calls me and asks me about a sensitive tooth, I'm doing teledentistry. Um, if, uh, if I'm chatting, I'm doing teledentistry. I can do a video, FaceTime. Um, I can be uh, uh, at my computer doing video, but I could also be uh, doing lots of other communications. I could be sending stuff back and forth. And this is the synchronous or real-time uh, uh, capabilities uh, that, that we have to deal with. But we also have asynchronous capabilities, meaning I can, I can look at the data at, at a later time. So it could be chat. It could be people uploading photos to me. It could be documents, forms, uh, email. Uh, texting. So any of those forms that I might not look at immediately are all asynchronous. So it's, once again, it's all around communication. It's, it's, it's really as simple as that. Um, here's where it begins to get a little bit more complicated though. So now we're not just communicating, but we're potentially communicating across a broad number of people with a broad number of communication tools. So a patient might be dealing with a hygienist, a dentist, perhaps another healthcare provider. I'll be talking about medical dental integration as, as we go through here. Maybe a physician, uh, somebody at the office, uh, uh, maybe somebody at a hospital. Uh, so there's all kinds of communications. And I think that is what, eight potential people? What is two to the eighth, uh, 264? So there's 264 potential uh, communication capabilities just in this little circle. And that little circle isn't as many people. So now all of a sudden it gets pretty complicated to keep all of this stuff together. And they have all those ways at the top of the screen that they can communicate with each other. And so, so one of the takeaways that I, that I want to uh, get across early on is, is teledentistry isn't simply video streaming. I mean, I hear that every day that, uh, oh yeah, we do teledentistry, we use Zoom. Or, you know, my, most of my patients have Apple, so I use FaceTime. That's one form of tel teledentistry, but it's really missing the big picture. Uh, some of us, some of us know certainly Paul Paul Glassman's model of going out into the community, and and uh, but it doesn't stop there either. Now, when I think of these simplistic sort of, to me they're simplistic, these simplistic sort of interpretations, I get this image. Uh, my mother, who's who's since passed away, uh, was at a lived in a retirement village uh, toward the end of her life, and I, I was over visiting once, and one of her uh, uh, friends asked me to help him with his iPhone. His, he, he had a new iPhone and he, there was just some things he wanted. So he passed it over to me <laughs> and I turned it over and on the back of the iPhone was paper taped to the iPhone with all the frequent numbers that he called. So, so here was this guy using an iPhone and still using uh, uh, the numbers that he had taped on. And of course, he just didn't know how to use it. But that's kind of the image. And if I could send you with an image, I'd like you to think of that one too. When you think of teledentistry, when somebody says, oh yeah, we do teledentistry, we use Zoom. You're just missing so much of the capabilities of what teledentistry can bring to the patient, to, uh, uh, to other professionals and so forth. So if, if here are the three things I'd like to, uh, to have you uh, end up with uh, when we're done. We can, we can talk about teledentistry, where it's been, where we, where we see it uh, today, uh, and, and we see it in a number of different growing ways. Um, you know, hopefully, you'll get a feel of where teledentistry is going, in part by what's going on today and, and where all the, uh, uh, the factors that are pointing us to the future seem to be taking us. Um, and then the third piece is we probably don't go through a week where we're talking to somebody who says, hey, I think I could use teledentistry for this, or hey, I think I could use it for that. Can we do that? People are coming up with new uses for teledentistry all the time, and it's really valuable. And we love to, to stimulate these conversations uh, so that people can see the value of teledentistry beyond just talking on a video conference with somebody. So let's talk about, uh, about uh, where it's been and where we see it headed at this point. So the timeline, the evolution of it, the timeline isn't uh, very good here. If I really were to have drawn it correctly, 
we started, most of us know the virtual dental home. That's a rephrasing of, of Paul Glassman's term for the studies that he did up at uh, University of Pacific when he was there. Uh, and that, that timeline is probably closing in on 10 years uh, in this particular thing before we get to the herringbone stuff. So if I were really to do this the right way in a timeline, I'd have probably nine inches of, uh, of uh, virtual dental home and then everything else squeezed into the last inch of, of everything else that I'm gonna talk about. But as time went on, you know, a couple things happened. Uh, uh, his model, of course, being the, the, that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, the mobile hybrid model, but it was mostly public health and, and not for profits and, and grant funded and so forth that, that were doing it. So we'd been talking about teledentistry for a long time, but it was primarily this model that was being used. And, and for those who aren't familiar, very quickly, it is, it is sending a hygienist or, or, or some group of people, depending on the regulatory environment of the state, uh, out to uh, typically community uh, locations in, in, in Paul's model, whether that's schools, whether it's uh, senior homes, et cetera. Uh, mobile equipment, hygienists doing preventive services, gathering diagnostic information, and then a dentist asynchronously reading the, the records later, determining whether further treatment needs to be needed, and then uh, the patient then somehow gets uh, directed to a bricks and mortar office. So that, that went along for a long time, as I said. And then a new sector popped up in, in, in the dental industry, and that was really growing on or building on Paul's model of uh, uh, still being the uh, mobile hybrid model, but going into commercial settings. So they were typically going into employer groups and employers liked it because they didn't lose their employees for half a day for cleanings and exams. Uh, the employees liked it typically, depending on the demographic, but employees liked it typically because of the convenience of it. Uh, and these companies were growing rapidly. Uh, and it was good for us because I'll back up a second. We had begun developing software to support Paul's model uh, somewhere just before that the herringbone start up there. So we saw a need for that. And I'll talk about that in, in the next slide a little bit. Um, and and for, for a company like ours, it was great when these TSOs, which we call tel teledentistry support organizations as opposed to uh, the full dental support uh, organizations. So when they popped up, our software was very good for them and it, and it really did make it scalable. Uh, it made it so that uh, these organizations could actually make money doing it instead of, instead of cobbling together uh, different types of software. Um, and, and again, I'll talk about the software more in the next, uh, in the next slide. And then other mobile, the, the TSOs were of course doing preventive services and diagnostic services on site, but then other mobile uh, entities decided to get into this because they wanted some teledentistry capabilities too. And kind of at the same time, we began to see something that was more valuable to maybe the solo dental office or, or, or the non-mobile is probably a better way of describing it. Um, and that really got started with, uh, I think the first we heard about mouthwatch was really that it's streaming with a, an inner oral camera. And that was uh, uh, kind of the beginning of where people could say there was, they were doing teledentistry. N not really very many were, uh, but nonetheless, it was there. We had, we had in ours, now we're supporting the mobile up, up above that line up above, but uh, we had the synchronous capability built in, but hardly anybody was using it. So there just wasn't that much need for, for synchronous online communication. And then of course the COVID hit. And then as, as soon as that hit and the shutdown hit, everybody began to scramble for uh, what, uh, what they considered to be teledentistry. And it was, it was as, as you probably know, and it seems like only yesterday, and it wasn't that far, it wasn't that far in the past, uh, but everybody was doing everything. And it could be Zoom, it could have been FaceTime, it could have been anything. And uh, uh, again, to, to, to us at, at uh, Virtual Dental Care, that's not teledentistry, that's only one very minor point, portion of it. But that's what opened the eyes of the dental profession, I think. Um, and uh, then networks came along. Uh, this isn't exactly a one-to-one -one timeline. Uh, and networks being uh, like the teledentists who uh, uh, were networks of dentists that were uh, like Teledoc in the, in the medical. So that uh, uh, insurance companies could offer the teledentists as a network to their members. So that uh, if members uh, needed emergency care, they could get online with, a, with one of the teledentists. And, uh, um, and then there's been a couple of networks that have popped up to, uh, since then. But as I said, this, this began to grow more and, and people started seeing other uses as long as they were gonna use, and, and, and really it was gonna be with more sophisticated products. It wasn't gonna be just with Zoom. Uh, but then, then we began to see other things, interest in patient engagement. I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this. So I won't, won't talk about it a lot now, but, but the world for, for patient involvement in their own healthcare opens up considerably more 
with, with teledentistry or telehealth technology. Continuity of care becomes easier, education becomes easier. Case presentation I'll talk a little bit about is, is beginning to open up record sharing because of the technology, collaboration, mentoring, patient flow management, and especially medical dental integration capabilities. Uh, so I'll end up talking about, uh, about all of these, but uh, this is where I would say we see it headed today. The TSOs and the, and the other mobile began to tie into these, these, other, fact, uh, these other capabilities too uh, that I've got on the right of the screen. And, and so now all of a sudden, again, it can, becomes a much more full offering. And that's really what's, uh, what I'll be talking about today then uh, is, is how full this is and where we see it going, uh, uh, where we see it going from here. So a couple of things about the technology. Um, really, I, I've separated it into three eras. Uh, the, the first one, you know, the, that long line that I said that would have been Paul Glassman's uh, era of, of people using uh, uh, teledentistry in the, uh, in the uh, virtual dental home model. Um, there really wasn't any need for new technology at that time because frankly, there wasn't any money to be made. It's, it's, it's really that simple. So what happened? Well, Applications got cobbled together. People were using the wrong tool in the wrong in the wrong way, but it was all they had. Uh, they were mostly using uh, traditional in-office uh, bricks and mortar uh, software to try and, and try to adapt it out in the field. There were some the use of, of some cloud-based systems helped a bit, but it was still the wrong tool for the wrong model. Definitely square peg, round hole stuff. And, uh, and so, you know, it, but it limped along. And, and again, it limped along because there just wasn't any reason for anybody to spend any, any investment money where there's nothing to be made back. Well, then era two came around and, and we put ourselves at virtual dental care into this era where we did anticipate that there would be a usage. I mean, from our standpoint, we really wanted to support that model to, uh, to deal with health for the underserved. And, and what we saw uh, as a company was uh, to get there we needed to make the model more scalable. You couldn't use these old fashioned cobbled together model uh, software and ever make it scalable enough to, uh, to be used in a big way. Uh, it, we see that if we, can, if we can show the world how treating the underserved can actually make money for the dentists, that that's gonna be the best thing that we can do. So making it scalable, making it efficient, uh, bringing ways to, to reach out in, in easier and, and more efficient ways is, is uh, really what we are looking at. And, and we did start a company based on what we thought anticipated usage and, and we weren't the only ones. Um, and then now we've, we've come into what I consider era three. And I think it was stimulated a lot by, by the COVID shutdown. Because uh, again, again, it opened the eyes of the industry to looking at uh, what could be down the road if I use teledentistry this way, that way, and, and so forth. And, and really, uh, let's talk about a couple more to give a, uh, takeaways then. Is, is, uh, one is, is usage drives evolution. If the shutdown hadn't happened, this could have probably taken five years to get to the point of, of where we are right now in terms of people using creativity. Um, and uh, usage uh, increases as we have use cases increasing. So some of the things I mentioned, case presentation, uh, use by orthodontists in a unique way, uh, use for, for triage being just one, use in these TSOs and, and other virtual dental home. Now all of a sudden there's a lot more creativity going on in the, uh, in the teledentistry world and more people then begin to come on. Uh, second thing is, is we need the tech, at this point in era three, we need the technology to drive the uses. It, it, it just doesn't do any good to try to uh, come up with an idea of, oh, I got it, I'm gonna use teledentistry for this and then run around and try to find the technology that, uh, that would support that. And the reason is, and if you can think back to that model, uh, to that slide I had where the, the, the model on the left is, it's just too complex now. We've got all of these interactions that we have to keep track of. We've got uh, all of these different communication modalities that we have to keep track of. Uh, traditional dental office software just can't do what is on the left right now. Uh, it's, it was never designed for telecommunications. It was never designed for communications in a, in a, in a very sophisticated way at all. So I, I, I do want uh, another of the takeaways to realize that uh, if you wanna see where the future is going, look towards technology. So he, here's kind of where we are today. This is, uh, this is uh, some, of the, some of the dreams that we're hearing about and some of the realities that are, that are actually out there right now. Um, it's both good news and bad news. The good news is, is going back to that second takeaway is, is, is use cases will drive more usage. Uh, the, the bad of that is that 
you can just hammer somebody with all the potential uses and they just won't use it. You know, hey, I just want to use it for telecom. I, I want to be on a video conference. That's it. Just don't don't give me all this other stuff. I don't know how to integrate it into my office. I have no idea how else I could use it. So, you know, this is going to be an evolution, you know, and I, I think we're beginning to stand if you look, you know, in the evolutionary uh, chart in the background and, uh, and, and, and we're coming close. Here's, you know, we get asked a lot, well, so where do you see this stuff happening today? Well, this will give you a, this chart that I put together to give you a sense of, you know, some of it's synchronous, some of it's asynchronous, a lot of it's somewhat combined. Um, so I can use in an emergency triage network, for instance, it's mostly going to be synchronous, but somebody might upload, upload a photo. I'm going to need forms to deal with. I'm going to have to have records that I deal with. So that's going to be asynchronous. But, you know, one of the interesting up at the top left uh, that we've seen a uh, just recently, a lot of uh, interest from orthodontists. So we're all used to the, uh, the two-week uh, appointments that have to be in office for an orthodontist. Well, now all of a sudden, it doesn't need to be. Um, and we've, had, we've got customers that are reporting that uh, uh, anywhere from 25 to, uh, we've heard 40, I've even heard as high as 60, I don't believe it, but percent of all, of all uh, appointments can be done uh, through a video conference. And so, especially in this in this uh, you know this this COVID world that we live in, keeping patients out of the office makes it uh, safer, but it also makes it easier and uh, and uh, the, the more convenient in a lot of senses because parents don't have to take off work to take their kids if it's a, if it's a child ortho and so forth. Uh, we see we see it being used for post op. Uh, that totally makes sense. Patient flow management. People are beginning to experiment there. Maybe I want to triage my patients before they come into the office. So maybe they don't have to come in today. Or maybe if they do come in today, my staff can take x-rays and, and uh, gather the records. And I don't even need, need to see the patient. I can follow up with a video appointment or some other type of asynchronous uh, follow-up with, uh, with the patient. So we are beginning to see that. Case presentation is, is a wonderful use of this. Uh, let me just paint one picture and, and I could paint 50, but uh, one picture would be for a dentist who's doing uh, uh, clear aligners, for example. Uh, so maybe the first appointment uh, that I have with the patient uh, is just, hi, nice to meet you, get to know you, find out what your issues are. Uh, you know, hey, if you can do this, please take a couple of, uh, of photos of, of your mouth, you know, one from the front, one, et cetera, uh, send it to me, and then I'll get back to you, and, uh, and we can talk about whether you're a good candidate, whether I think you're a good candidate or not. So that's, that's appointment number one, and maybe it's only 15 or 20 minutes. It's done on everybody's uh, um, uh, convenience, so I, it doesn't have to be an appointment where they're physically coming into the office. Um, and then another aspect of teledentistry is, is I can actually do the presentation to the patient and I don't even have to be there. So I can actually film a video of myself, maybe a minute, minute and a half video of myself, uh, record it, and uh, I can explain to the patient, yes, you're an excellent candidate for this. It looks to me like you'll need 20 trays. I'm making this up as I go. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it's going to be uh, uh, 24 months and, and so forth. And maybe you're, you even tie in a, a treatment coordinator or financial coordinator so that you can talk about what the price of it's going to be. Uh, embed a video about uh, clear aligners into it. Do show some before and after photos, potentially. So now all of that workup has been done with me only spending maybe as the dentist, maybe 15 or 20 minutes and doing it at my own convenience. And the patient reviewing these records at his or her own convenience, if it's ortho, maybe the parents uh, at, at their own convenience. So they don't have to take off work to come in and hear that case presentation from me. So this is the kind of creativity that we're seeing growing out of, out of the tools that teledentistry brings to the table. I mentioned uh, TSOs, uh, uh, again, a, a natural for, for that to tie in a lot of the stuff I just described. Case presentation could be part of that. Uh, certainly patient flow management. It, it just all ties in. The virtual dental home model only gets better uh, with, with all of these other tools. And I'll, I'll talk about patient focus in just a second. Medical dental integration is just starting. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about, uh, again, where the future is, is, is how this is going to tie into the future, we think, in a really big way in, in just a second. But the telecommunication tools uh, that, uh, that are now out there that just weren't there even two, three years ago, uh, it just is so much more easier to begin to envision what a medical dental integration could actually look like. So what is the future? Let me, uh, let me uh, spend now, put on, put on my uh, 
or put my crystal ball in front of me and let's start talking about what we have. So the McKinsey and company put out a, a, a very famous study now for anybody that's in the telehealth world uh, and, and anybody who's investing in the telehealth world uh, that's, uh, that uh, projected, projected income from telehealth services in the US can go up to $250 billion in 2021. I mean, that's next year. 250 billion is a quarter of a trillion dollars for telehealth services, uh, up from the current 3 billion. So wh what's gonna bring this 830% explosion? Well, it's gonna take a few things and I'll talk about that in the next slide, but you can imagine that that kind of growth is gonna be felt by patients, it's gonna be felt by providers, it's gonna be felt by the technology world in, in, a, in, a, in a very, very strong way over the next uh, uh, 12 to 12, I'll say 24 months, I'll take it out further. I don't think it's gonna all happen in 2021. So, but they, they also cautioned, and this becomes the roadmap to me, they also cautioned that what could slow it down are really three barriers. And that is, is there's gotta be value to the patient. Now, I, I I haven't done a, 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 a telehealth. My wife has, and I was actually in the room. It was really kind of ridiculous. I mean, they might as well they might as well have been on the phone. I mean, it was it was fine. I mean, you know, they were talking, you know, but uh, you know, personally, a lot of people don't like to do the video conference thing. Maybe a chat, you know, maybe you know. So so if there's really something to see, yes, it makes sense. But if it's just there gratuitously so that I can be uh, talking to somebody face to face, then that, that there's not a lot of value to me as the patient. Value to the provider becomes a, a, another issue. Um, it wasn't too easy for the dentist, or the dentist, the, the physician that was talking to my wife. He, he had to go to two different rooms ultimately <laughs> before he could do the appointment. And, uh, and that's, that was very inconvenient, obviously disrupted his day. Um, it, it, you could see it wasn't in the, in the, in the workflow pattern of that, uh, of that uh, physician. Um, and that's the case with, with dentists too, of course. And, and so, you know, again, it's one thing to to do a FaceTime, walk into another room and talk to a patient. It's another to, to bring all of this stuff that I just talked about before into, into the overall workflow so that it becomes part of, of what the, the dental office uh, routine is about. Uh, so that it's routine to the patient how to access it and why to access it. It's routine to the office staff how to access it and why to access it. And, and, and uh, obviously it has to be convenient too. And then ultimately the uh, the value of the technology. I mean, there's there is uh, I've got some slides on these, so I'll, I'll end up talking a little bit more about it. So, what's it going to be like for the patient? Um, we're addressing when I say we're, I, I mean the tel the, the the telehealth technology world is 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 aware of these three things. Uh, we were putting a lot of focus on these three things because obviously the future growth is dependent on the successful uh, uh, addressing of, of these uh, three, uh, three barriers. Uh, so the first one is the patient. Well, you know, again, let me start where, where with, this, with this complicated slide of how the patient now, literally today, uh, but it's going to get better and better over time, has access to so much more information and so many more ways to communicate with so many different types of providers. So now all of a sudden for the patient, it, 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 as long as the technology is set up right and in the right setting, has much more ability to participate in their own healthcare. So they don't have to wait to hear from a provider. They can actually go access the records. Maybe it's lab, uh, lab results that I wanna see. Uh, maybe after I see the lab results, I wanna chat quickly with uh, my doctor. Uh, maybe I wanna set up a, a televideo conference appointment with my doctor. Uh, maybe the nurse uh, it, it needs to give some input. All of this stuff now can be done through these through this the miracle of of telecommunications that just couldn't be done before. So I, I think that you're going to see then much more user friendly or or patient friendly interfaces, and uh, uh, we're certainly doing that with our with our technology, and and we're seeing a big boom come from it. So so this is this is really one of the places that I think you're going to see a, a lot of movement uh, in the next. Uh, uh, again, the next 12 to 24 months to where the patients are going to be brought into their own healthcare in a way that they, they just couldn't be in the past. Uh, to the providers, certainly workflow is going to be part of it. But again, the world opens up so much more to the provider if we start talking about collaboration. So we, we've got a component of our software. Again, this is just us and, and I'm not selling our software, but uh, we've got a component that, that uh, opens the world for collaboration. So what we've done is, is we've actually mimicked a social network, a HIPAA compliant social network, where I can invite, uh, if I'm a user of our software, I can invite 
whoever I want into my network. They don't need to even be subscribers to my software. And I can communicate with them. I can share information. I can refer information. We can share records. We can have a common patient record that's, uh, that'll be common to all of us. And that data then could be integrated into their own, their own systems uh, that they work with. You know, again, a lot of the systems out there don't have the ability to support what, I, what I'm showing here. So some of the stuff's gonna have to be telecommunication EHR. The other is gonna have to be, you know, that can be imported. They will be into the existing practice management system or, or hospital business system or whatever it is. So, so this collaboration is going to expand. And again, if you think of LinkedIn for, uh, for uh, providers, so I can, I can invite whoever I want into my network. Uh, if I'm an orthodontist, maybe it's my referring dentists. If I am a, uh, uh, if I'm a periodontist, uh, maybe I want an internist involved. Maybe I want a, a cardiologist involved because of some of the questions I might have for my patient. This can all be done with, with teledentistry technology or telehealth technology. It's in our application right now. It's doable today. I can create, I can create uh, uh, networks, just again, think of LinkedIn. I, I can create a network and maybe if I'm a DSO, I wanna be able to mentor all of the uh, dentists or I wanna discuss cases. So essentially I can create a virtual study club, if, if you will. And I can put up information and everybody that's in that group will be notified that I've added something to the, uh, uh, to the group. And somebody can go in and comment on it. Everybody will be notified. They can go in and see what the comments are. I can put a video up. Maybe if I'm a, a, periodon <clears throat> excuse me, a periodontist who's done surgery, maybe I'll even put a, a video of the surgery up. Maybe we'll have a video conference where everybody's there and including the patients to talk about it. So, so again, you know, it, it's sort of a superstar charged study club that everybody can uh, uh, use and build on. And, and uh, uh, again, I think the, the provider, the ability of the provider uh, to treat their patients better over time with telehealth communications is going to be tremendous. So, and then the third component, is, as I described, was the telehealth enabled electronic record. So, so if, a, if a physician, let's say an internist is seeing, uh, and I'm a periodontist and I, I want to uh, say something, or I'm a, I'm a pediatric dentist and uh, a pediatrician, I want to tie it in. Well, we have one common record now uh, through this where I can make comments or whatever. And again, that can, that can be pushed in if it's pertinent and, and it's able to, I can get pushed into my practice management system. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got this common record that that's, uh, anybody can look at if they have permission to look at it. And, and again, think of LinkedIn uh, in a, a secure HIPAA setting where I've allowed uh, you know, 10, 10 providers to see my patient's records uh, and we can go on for them. So, so the promise of where this could go, and this really is then, Kind of the beginning of, of the a discussion that any of us would have around uh, uh, medical dental integration, uh, and and we we've got one customer um, uh, that is that is uh, using our software that is a, a Medicare Advantage uh, health insurer, uh, and they particularly uh, uh, there's a very specific niche. Uh, they they insure institutionalized special needs patients, so mostly Alzheimer's patients. Uh, that's a very tough group, obviously, to get dental care to. Uh, so we've worked through a couple of different pilots with them, and it's all worked out fairly well. Uh, but the one we're working with uh, uh, most promisingly right now, we think, is that uh, uh, to teach, to, to, to arm the um, visiting nurses uh, with uh, either an intraoral camera or some intraoral uh, imaging device uh, that's easy to use. Um, anybody who has worked on an Alzheimer's patient, of course, it's, it's, it's a broad spectrum, but it can be very difficult. So, so if they can, in fact, take a picture or two if there's a problem, get that information to a dentist, maybe bring it up on a real-time basis, or maybe just review the records later. Uh, if further treatment's needed, then that's going to typically require, uh, um, obviously, bringing the patient to a, to a different setting for treatment. Uh, but that's, that's only one example. Uh, another great example that, that we've run across, and, and most of this is in the talking phase, by the way, is to put a hygienist into a, a, a medical facility. We've uh, I talked with one uh, a risk bearing uh, uh, Medicare Advantage group that uh, offers as part of their benefit, uh, they offer a, uh, a limited dental carve out of, of uh, uh, periodontal care uh, for patients who have periodontal disease and have diabetes. Uh, so I think we all know the connection there and, and, and treating chronic diseases, keeping people's mouths healthy, especially when they have chronic diseases is, is very important. Um, and so they, they want those patients then to get that periodontal treatment if they're diabetic and, and they have a periodontal disease. So, so one of the discussions, one of the examples is to have a hygienist actually physically be in the ambulatory uh, uh, clinic and, and work with the mobile equipment. 
for instance, like the that's uh, the that the uh, TSOs or or the virtual dental home does. And so the, the medical facility doesn't have to build a dental clinic out to treat those patients. The hygienist can maybe just wheel between treatment rooms or maybe even an open office, uh, which is exactly what they do in the TSO, uh, in the TSO setting. Uh, the hygienist can then coordinate care. Uh, so th in many respects, it's co-located. There'll be a dentist, maybe even only across the street, but there'll be a dentist uh, very near that can look at the records. If the patients need further treatment, uh, then it's simple enough to send them across the street for the bricks and mortar treatment. So, so now we've got a, a situation where you've got a dental, uh, a dental professional, a hygienist in this case, working in a medical facility, and you get a common touch point for the patient. Uh, they come in for their, uh, for their cleaning or, or whatever treatment is the hygienist is going to perform, scaling and roof cleaning maybe, uh, and then maybe a nurse will come over and uh, uh, do a blood test. I, I, making this up, but it, it, one, it just makes it more convenient for the patient in that scenario. So, so again, it's, it's, as, uh, uh, it's as limiting as our imagination will let it be in terms of, of that. So what, what, is, what is common to, to making uh, uh, medical dental integration work? Well, number one, communications. Number two, understanding how to communicate. None of us were taught in dental school or medical school how to communicate uh, across, uh, across these subspecialties. So if we can have a hygienist that facilitates that, I think everybody's open to it. It's just nobody really knows how to do it. So, so now all of a sudden we have, uh, we have numerous other ways to, uh, uh, to bring the dental into a medical setting. So what's the future? Well, I, I, really this is a summary slide. Um, we can we can see that uh, uh, there's going to be a much higher level of patient participation. I think the common language right now is patient engagement, but uh, but we like to take it in a step further and call it patient participation. Give the patient the ability to access the information they need, the educational materials they need, the communications with the various uh, uh, specialists and, and subspecialists, et cetera, that they need. Um, and so on. Professional collaboration is going to be a big, uh, a big aspect of it, um, and and the ability for for professionals. And I, I won't limit it to dentists, but uh, certainly to, in the dentistry uh, uh, industry, I think things will look a lot different two years from now than they do now in terms of how integrated teledentistry is into a dental practice. It's not something that's just you know, on the side and it's kind of a pain and I don't really like doing it, but I guess I will. Um, and then you're gonna see this tele telehealth uh, uh, electronic record become something that people don't envision. I mean, right now, you need to spend two seconds on that. Uh, one of the first questions we'll get when we're talking to a dentist about our software is, does it integrate with my software? And the answer is, I mean, because nobody wants two softwares, right? <laughs> Everybody wants one solution in one place, but, but it's just not realistic. You know, no, no, no dentistry software today in office dentistry software can handle all the massive communications, all the texts that might be going back and forth and the history behind it, all the emails that have gone back and forth, records that have been exchanged. That just isn't the way a, a bricks and mortar dental office runs. And so the software that, to support it, there's great software out there. It's just the software to support it doesn't exist. So, and to go across multiple platforms, medical, dental, uh, and, and, and multiple. So, so yes, we'll be able to, uh, to export and we do. Uh, to, to some degree now, and we're getting more all the time. We'll export the, the data that, that is appropriate to be exported. Um, if if a, for a dental office, that could very well be what treatment was rendered. Well, we'll push that data into it. Maybe they want to do the billing. The telehealth record won't have very much to do with the billing. It can, but it, it really won't. It'll be very lightweight there. Uh, but what it will be is, is uh, sending the information uh, uh, into the practice management application that's pertinent. And, and I should have probably had that arrow go both ways uh, because we do actually pull data out of uh, the practice management systems to, uh, to tie it back into the tele, telehealth uh, record. So that was me talking fast and trying to get through as uh, much uh, as I could. Again, what we try to do is, you know, rarely when, when we have a conversation like I'm having with you right now, uh, do we not hear somebody say, hey, I got an idea. Could I use it for this? And it's, you know, that's a good idea. <laughs> and, and so, you know, as, as those ideas happen, uh, more use cases come up. And to go back to one of my takeaways, more development's going to come up when, when the use cases demand it. And uh, uh, the, the, the software right now is getting very sophisticated. Uh, it has to be to support this really and make it scalable in any way. Uh, and uh, I think you're going to see more of it. But I think that's also going to give you the roadmap 
uh, for where things are going. I mean, look at where the technology is, look at where the technology development is going, uh, because that's going to be people like, uh, like those in my company that uh, are looking out toward the future and saying, where do, where do we have to be when, the, when that future arrives? So with that, um, I am going to assume, and I, I don't know, uh, Frank, whether you're going to take it over, if we can do Q&A, or I think that's probably going to be done via the, via the chat. We've got uh, Dr. Uh, Matali Hariwala uh, uh, helping, helping out there, and uh, uh, we'll go ahead and answer any questions if, uh, if anybody has any. Hey, Bill. So, um, hi, everyone. This is Dr. Mitali Hariwala. Um, we do have some questions, some great ones in the Q&A, and I've been answering along, but um, if it's okay with you, I'll pose them to you so that we can make sure that everyone hears the response. So, the first is, how can a patient take a clear picture of tooth teeth tissue? Well, there's a couple of different uh, technologies emerging right now, devices, and uh, I, I particularly like one that's out of, uh, that's out of Australia uh, that was actually initially intended, well, I think it's still used, it's initially intended to, do, to uh, uh, take uh, intraoral photographs of the throat. Uh, so it's, a, it's basically a tongue depressor with, uh, that, it hooks up to, uh, uh, that hooks up to your mobile device. And uh, uh, so you can clear out the tongue, the lips, uh, whatever, get a clear shot at it, and, uh, and it has a bright light associated with it, uh, and it really makes a very clear picture. Uh, some, some entities, now the, the uh, um, uh, if I didn't mention it, the, uh, the uh, people that are going into the Alzheimer's home, the, the traveling nurses, uh, are going to carry a, an intraoral camera with them uh, so that they can uh, uh, try to get a, a view. Um, so, so that's, uh, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to do a diagnosis by smiling at somebody on a video conference, <laughs> but I think there are some of these other tools that'll uh, uh, be more readily available. And I mean, some of the stuff may just even be over the counter kind of stuff that, uh, like I just described, a tongue depressor with a bright light on it that, uh, uh, that can show the uh, uh, certain uh, sections of the mouth and maybe even templates that can be uh, available to the patients to be able to take it. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, how are you dealing with HIPAA and um, are the communications encrypted? The, um, the, the second question and answer is the first. <laughs> yes, everything is encrypted. So, so our software is, is completely HIPAA compliant and uh, um, we go far beyond that even. But, uh, but yes, everything is, uh, uh, everything is secure. Everything is in an encrypted database. All the data transmissions are encrypted. Uh, so, so we follow the uh, we follow the lines of, of uh, uh, and everything HIPAA demands and then some. Great. The next is how do you manage the consent process? Well, in our case, uh, this patient participation uh, uh, circle that I have there uh, includes the ability for uh, for patients to fill out all kinds of forms. And those forms can be specific to the, I'll talk about dentists, but it can be specific to the dental office. So they could be created by the dental office to, to uh, uh, mimic the forms they already have in their office. We have default forms. Uh, so, so there's all sorts of uh, forms available to the patient. In our software, at any rate, we, we allow uh, in, in, a, in the setup process for the, uh, for the provider to decide whether the patient needs to fill out those forms prior to any appointments or they let them make appointments, but they have to fill out the forms prior to the actual appointment itself, or in some cases they say, we'll, we'll get it later. Uh, but all of those forms are available in our software as part of a secure setting. It, what I didn't mention that is, is very key to all of this is having a, a common uh, patient portal uh, where information can be exchanged uh, so that uh, if, if I want to communicate with the patient, uh, I've got a number of ways to do it in, in our software at any rate. Um, and, and all those communication tools that I described earlier, all of that is in a secure setting. Um, and then the forms become part of that secure patient record, overall patient record. Uh, uh, so what, what I'm calling the telehealth electronic record here, that's uh, that lower uh, circle all becomes part of uh, of uh, the record and, and, and certainly any forms that the patient needs to fill out. It, it, in our software, at any rate, you can, you can customize those forms to, to be whatever you want, but they're all part of the patient record at that point. 
Next question is, do you have any insight on Texas's approval for teledentistry? Oh, if anybody has any, raise their hand. <laughs> no, I, uh, I don't know. I've, we we uh, have heard, you know, nary a day goes by, I don't think, when I hear something. I, I certainly talked with uh, some people just yesterday, and it was, how can you make them do it? It's a little, sorry, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> I can't make them do anything. So it's, uh, it's going to have to be the, uh, you know, I, I heard even that there's, there's a, a shortage of, uh, um, a shortage of dentists and, and they had too many hygienists. So you would think it would be pretty easy to figure that one out. But at any rate, I, it, it, it's political above my pay grade. Great, so this is another question regarding state laws. Many state laws will not allow RDH to work without a direct um, dentist supervisor, even if they have a general supervision on their license. Will this be addressed by individual state laws or will it soon be general knowledge for all states? Oh, would that there be a way to do the last one, but no, it's gonna have to be, it's gonna have to be individual states uh, as, as it's currently. Now, really what you're talking about is, is in the mobile setting. Um, and, and certainly I am hoping that states like uh, success of, of mobile teledentistry uh, in, in the states that do allow uh, a hygienist to, to have an expanded function uh, will be seen by other states and, and the value will be seen. Unfortunately, there's you know, a lot of mix up. You know, I, I was being a little bit curt about Texas, but I think the biggest issue there is that, uh, um, what's the, uh, the name of the, the company that uh, uh, is supposedly doing telehealth, uh, Smile Direct Club? And you know that that that's not teledentistry, <laughs> but it gets all lumped together of of where people are doing, um, you know, people are doing services, dental services, and calling them something else. This that's one person's opinion, but uh, and and so that's uh, that caught, that creates a problem, um, and uh, you know you, you you need to have professionals involved in professional treatment, but uh, um, you know. So be it. We'll, we'll, we'll see over time. But again, I, I will separate out uh, a mobile from, from uh, in-office stuff. Great. And then um, a question from our friend, Linda Brookman. Medical dental integration is long overdue, so I'm excited to hear about progress in this area. Who would be paying the RDH working in the medical office? In the particular scenario that we had pitched, it would that that would be part of the dental benefit that is being offered by the uh, uh, that is offered by the medical uh, uh, risk you know the MCO in, in, in that in this case so they would be paid by the uh, however that would be worked out now it may be have to be working with the dentist across the street uh, uh, to to do it I'm, I'm not sure what legally it is but uh, it would come through the benefits uh, that uh, that would have been uh, uh, been paid to the, uh, to the uh, medical organization uh, from Medicare in, in that scenario. That was probably a confusing answer, but <laughs> the hygienist would be getting paid uh, ultimately by, uh, uh, through the payment that, the, that the, uh, uh, this, the, the managed care organization received from, uh, uh, from Medicare. And then somehow that would uh, end up again, maybe the dentist gets paid and the dentist pays the hygienist or maybe they pay the hygienist directly. I, I haven't looked into the specifics. Yeah, I, I have to admit this is all theoretical at this point. It's a really good solution, uh, but we haven't seen it yet. Great, the next question is, is there a role for a dentist who is no longer in active dental practice or retired? And if so, what would that role be? Well, I think, We've seen it with uh, one of our, a couple, we have two customers that do, um, uh, well, one soon to be customer uh, and, and one customer that do uh, sort of the teledoc uh, solution for teledentistry. So, so essentially it could be through an insurance company, um, I can get a teledentistry uh, emergency appointment to find out what's going on. And, and so in that scenario, um, who, the dentist just needs to be licensed, of course, in the state where they're uh, making their suggestions and uh, uh, they can work with one of these organizations. I would say working with an organization like that probably makes sense uh, because there has to be a fair amount of coordination of, of uh, you know, patient uh, making a call, getting into a queue, being directed uh, properly, 
uh, to the right uh, to the right decision uh, to the right uh, the decision has to be made that they're going to a dentist if I'm in California and it's a California licensed dentist that's doing the diagnosis etc so so there are organizations that uh, if I were a retired dentist and were considering doing that I'd you know want to contact uh, either uh, uh, the teledentists or a company called Virtudent is also doing it This question is in regards to TSOs. Do TSOs utilize uniform video oral health screening slash diagnostic programs that collect rich data to facilitate record keeping, treatment planning, and procedural referrals? Well, I think that's in the offing for all of them. At least I've heard those discussions. I think right now it is, uh, um, and, and this is me never having been out in the field with them. I've only heard discussions, but uh, I think what they're doing right now is pretty routine data collection. Uh, routine meaning that they've got uh, handheld uh, uh, x-ray machines, they're doing di digital imaging, they're taking intraoral photographs, um, and what they do in the diagnostic process I think is probably pretty routine, routine in terms of what would normally be done in a dental office. As far as, as, far as getting sophisticated, I think that potential is out there and I think it makes sense. 